few weeks after construction restarting, work continues despite the constant protest. A High Court injunction prevents anyone associated with the speak campaign from standing within 50 yards of the site, apart from on one afternoon a week. The boundary is marked with red lines on the pavement. But the injunction doesn't stop them. On other days, they set up on the edge of the exclusion zone. Do something useful today! Pack in your job! Go and get a proper job! Go and earn a living doing something useful! Do something for the community! A crane is being delivered. The protesters are collecting the number plates of lorries and vans entering the site. They hope to trace the builders or any of their suppliers. Go and get a job in McDonald's or whatever! Why have you got to work in this hellhole? To achieve its aim, the campaign involves more than just standing outside the lab. Demonstrating to anyone part of it, I mean, it operates on lots of levels. Uh, a lot of work has to be done on base intelligence, on uh, trying to work out who's doing what and why. Um, so it's, it makes it quite a important part of what we're doing because the more you know about what you're up against the more you can you can do to be effective in challenging it i mean it's you know it's 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 standard practice with any campaign um the reason we, we come up here is because some time ago um it was discovered that um a company called terex was supplying crane parts um that were being used at south parks road site and we've done quite a lot of research and we've discovered in fact Terex do have a site here at Hayford. Um, would you hope there'd be a campaign against like the contractors that you discover now like there was against Well that's you know that's something that I can't judge or can't say will or will not happen. The animal rights movement is a very big movement and I can only you know I'm a part of speak and, and we're bound by this high court injunction but you know others aren't. <laughs> The campaign against the lab is relentless and constant. Protesters often leaflet in the city centre. We're not the same as an animal, are we? If we were, we'd be either swinging through trees or eating cat food and eating dog food. But their methods don't seem that successful at winning hearts and minds. They just shout. For one onlooker, the barrage has made a real impression. Well, I was sitting in a coffee shop and I heard uh, Stop the Oxford Animal Lab. I decided to go out and um, shout my own slogan, Build the Oxford Animal Lab. They turned around and uh, started shouting F off and uh, so forth and uh, torture, I believe I was called. And, uh, oh yes, human excrement. And I decided that was none. I decided I deserve a right to free speech, and I went, got an A2 piece of card, marker pen, and made my own banner saying, support progress, build the Oxford Animal Lab. If it weren't for police uh, intervention, I'm pretty certain I would have been assaulted. Uh, one man, for example, came up to me with his dog and started shouting right in my face, do you want to torch my dog, do you want to torch my dog? One of them actually tried to grab my sign. I resisted um, and said, no, don't, please don't take my sign. But she ripped corner off it, um, clearly striking a blow for free speech there. So I decided to start my own group in support of scientific research. The arrival of Laurie Pycroft is an unexpected twist. But will a 16-year-old really be able to achieve anything when most of his elders are still too scared to speak? I set up a website uh, on the first day that protest existed and within, uh, within a day we were getting hundreds of hits. Although he has only the embryo of an organisation, he has a very clear set of ideas. We stand for scientific reasoning, but we're not a immoral organisation. We, um, we do respect the... Uh, lives of animals and uh, their right not to suffer but we believe that the rights of humans come above that.
the struggle over the Oxford lab heats up. This city has had a unique place in the war between scientists and animal rights activists. Many of the most famous battles have been fought on these streets. The modern animal rights movement actually began here 34 years ago. It was then that a group of radical vegans first challenged the idea that man should have dominion over animals. Chief among them was a young philosophy lecturer called Peter Singer. In Oxford in 1972, he invented the phrase animal liberation and wrote a book of the same name which was based on one overriding principle. I discuss in that the principle of equality that we are used to applying only to humans and I ask what is it in virtue of what is it that we say all humans are equal in the end I think what you come down to say is well all humans have interests they all have lives to lead their lives can go well or badly and we shouldn't discount their interests in living a good life just because for example they're from a different country or a different race or they're a woman and we're a man or something of that sort so in that sense the same is true of animals and there's no reason why we should give less consideration, less weight to the interests of a being just because it's not a member of our species. In the 1970s, Singer revealed the routine abuse inflicted on animals as they were tested for cosmetics and put under extreme stress, and that five million were slaughtered for animal research every year. But what made Singer really controversial was saying that experimenting on animals was not much different to testing on children. Humans, that is, normal humans beyond infancy, are different from animals in that they have higher rational capacities and um, uh, you know, can reason and so on. Um, but uh, not all humans are like that, of course. Infants are not, and uh, those with severe intellectual disability are not. Yet we still think that they matter morally. We still never treat them in the way we treat animals in experiments, for example, although humans, you know, humans would be a better model in many ways. But we don't say, oh, well, here we have some humans who are at the same level of reasoning as, as a pig or a dog, so we can use them as we would use a pig or a dog. We don't do that. Singer's claim that animals are equal to humans is at the heart of the debate. And it's what those in favour of animal experimentation most disagree with. It's, it's great to be pleasant to animals, I'm not denying that. Um, one of the things that allows us to say that we are truly above the other animals is that uh, we have compassion for lower life forms. But that compassion shouldn't extend to uh, putting ourselves out. Singer's book became a bestseller and its ideas were profoundly influential. In the last 30 years, there have been many changes to how scientists use animals. The number of animals used in experiments has almost halved. Research is no longer allowed on chimpanzees or higher apes, or for cosmetics. And now to get a license to carry out research involves demonstrating that the harm to animals is worth the potential benefit to patients. So 30 years after Singer wrote his book, what's an animal experiment like today? Carolyn Lacey is a neuroscientist at Oxford University. Like Tipu Aziz, she studies the part of the brain that goes wrong in movement disorders. She uses rats. He's got nice fur, so nice and sleek, and his eyes are not watery, so that means they're not infected. So we're just going to pick him up if he wants to come. There you go. And put him in this cage be transported. You can see he's very happy still. Not scared. Are you going to name him? <laughs> what do you want to be named? Philip? Do you name each of your rats, Carolyn? Um, yeah, I do, but most people don't. And why I do just... you name them? I quite like to have a friendship with my rats because I, I think of them not as a number but um, as my friends because they're helping me discover 
things that can help medical research. And if I was going to be part of a medical research experiment, I wouldn't want a number. I'd want to be talked to with my name. Now, I don't, don't want you to be um, afraid of this. So what's going to happen is it's going to start falling a little bit because it's like getting drunk like most people when they have anaesthetic. You can see he's, he's trying to figure out where he is and now the anaesthetic is setting in a little bit so he's uh, wobbling. Now this isn't hurting him in any way, he's just feeling a bit drunk, a bit woozy and soon he'll fall asleep. He'll give up fighting. You can see. He's getting more and more woozy. I'm just going to lay him down here to sleep for a little bit longer. To witness this scene is confusing. Fast asleep in Carolyn's lab, Philip looks almost cute, but I'll have no qualms about killing a rat if it appeared in my kitchen. When the animal rights activists call people like, you know, they call you, they call people like you torturers. Yeah. And how do you feel when they call you torturers? Um. I'm just amazed by it because they, ha they have absolute no knowledge really of what really goes on in the animal houses and uh, you can see here from what I've done that we're not torturing the rats. None of us are animal torturers in the way that any of us would want to hurt the rats. I mean, if I was hurting a rat, I wouldn't be happy at all. In fact, I'd stop because I don't want to hurt my rats. They're here to help me and I don't want to give them any pain. So now we're just bringing him into the surgery room and we're going to put it in place him just on this blanket which is temperature controlled. So the next stage will be the surgery which will involve um, um, cutting open the skull and um, showing the cranium of the brain and then we will in insert the electrode. Although it seems that the animal is being treated kindly and it's suffering no pain, never far away is the thought that he's about to have his head opened up and an electrode inserted into his brain. So why would anyone do this? We're trying to analyse single cells in the brain these are the cells that degenerate in Parkinson's disease. And so it is important for us to understand those cells at a basic fundamental level and how they function in a normal brain in order to understand what goes wrong. And then we can put all this data together about its physiological characteristics, i.e. how it fires, how it looks, and how it connects to other brain areas in order to under, understand that cell much more for therapeutic strategies. So once we're in the brain, the brain actually doesn't feel pain, obviously, because that, the brain is what processes pain. So the actual brain itself doesn't feel pain. So once we're in the brain with the electrode, the, the, the rat won't be able to feel it, even if he was awake. Seeing a rat with a wire in its head seems a long way from benefiting human patients. But for hundreds of years, it's basic experiments like this that have given doctors the foundation on which to build new therapies. It's at this stage that all medical advances are made. It's often not in a doctor's surgery or a hospital. It's at this stage that medical advances are made. And I think there is little awareness of that in the public. And we're not being cruel to animals in order to, be, to do this. But we're trying to help everyone with our medical research. Are you not scared of talking? No, I think it's important that there's um, a balanced view of the public because right now scientists have kept quite quiet about what we do as if we're afraid or we have something to hide. But we don't have anything to hide. It's just we just... We're quite happy with what we do. We keep quiet because we work hard. And so I think it's important now for us to stand up for our rights now that things are getting a bit out of hand in Oxford and we're being treated like criminals.
and I think it's important that awareness is made because I'm proud of what I do and I'm not afraid to stand up for medical research. At the end of the day, Philip is put down with an overdose of painkiller and incinerated. Whilst the 500,000 rats that are killed in labs every year might seem like a lot, it pales into insignificance compared to the almost 10 million that are killed by pest control.